Uh, good afternoon. This is attorney David Gibbs, and I'm the uh, president and general counsel of the National Center for Life and Liberty. And uh, we are conducting this webinar, and uh, please uh, feel free to join in or encourage others, uh, talking about opening your church back up and the different programs that are in place to help churches, but to kind of give you an update on what is happening with all things COVID-19. Uh, many of you are familiar with our ministry, but just to give you a, a short explanation, we're a legal ministry uh, that is available to you. Uh, we believe in the church. We believe in what you're doing, and we want to be a help to you in every way that we can. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, ncll.org will give you a lot of information, and a lot of the things that I'll talk about today, uh, you can get resources, downloads, uh, short videos, things that would be helpful to you as we talk about opening the church back up in what we'll call now the post-COVID universe. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to probably put forward as a, an opening theme is church is going to be different compared to We're getting just a little echo there on our end. We apologize. Church is going to be different in a post-COVID world as compared to how it was before COVID. Uh, we're going to be having to look at church in a different way. And so if you're expecting when you open your church back up that it's going to be just identical to uh, the way it was before, uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Uh, we are going to be living in a world where the, the health and the safety and the welfare of the people uh, is going to be something now that is going to have to be balanced. And as we talk through opening your church back up, I want to kind of give you kind of a, a theme to think about that we're watching now where the government uh, in many jurisdictions is reducing the mandates. Uh, they are taking away the government guidelines and they're giving us now the option to reopen or the process by which we can reopen. But that is going to shift now the liability from the government directives over to the individual organizations. So the churches are now going to have to assume the responsibility for uh, their practices and what they're doing to keep people safe. Uh, very similar to how we have safety plans to keep our campuses safe from intruders or active shooters. Uh, very similar to how we have plans in place to keep our children safe uh, with child protection policies from any of the one that would want to hurt or abuse them. It is now going to be incumbent on church leaders to start thinking about health and safety plans, uh, things that you're going to have in place in your ministry that will help um, prevent the unwanted, unnecessary spread of any virus, whether it's COVID-19 or other things. And so I do want you, as you're thinking about reopening, to realize that we are now watching where there is going to be an increased standard of care or expectation that organizations where groups gather um, are going to need to be thinking about protecting the health and safety of individuals. Um, we're watching now where um, litigation is beginning to commence across the nation. I'm not personally aware of a church that has been sued uh, for a COVID infection. But uh, a number of nursing homes have already been sued. Some funeral homes have been sued. Some employers have been sued for not keeping things safe for their employees. And so I do want you as pastors and ministry leaders to realize that the government mandates are one phase of this. But we're certainly going to be watching where the liabilities are now going to be shifting over onto the individual organizations. So um, malls are now reopening but they are trying to balance how to handle the liability issues. Uh, we're watching where Disney World here in the state of Florida, or California, would be potentially able to reopen, but they are concerned about liability issues. So I want you as uh, church leaders to understand that this is going to be something that is going to require an ongoing diligence. And so as we're working past the government mandates, this is going to be a new arena of concern for ministry leaders that is going to continue past COVID-19 and will actually probably establish now higher standards for the safety, the welfare of individuals who attend your public services in the group gathering. Now, as you're thinking about reopening, 
a few quick points I do want to stress. Uh, number one, uh, make sure that you're evaluating what is best for your church. Uh, I talk with churches where there's a few dozen people up to a few thousand. And so every church has to take an individualized approach in terms of how they're handling this, what the infection rates are in their area, what their community is like. Um, also understand what mandates are in your area. Um, I'm finding a lot of confusion nationally as states are beginning to relax mandates, but then different counties, different cities, different jurisdictions are coming in. And I'm not saying all of these mandates are correct. I'm not saying even that they're constitutional at this point, but I am saying you need to know what they are. And so listen carefully. And, and we've had situations where one mandate gets issued and then public officials make comments contrary to it. So I do wanna let you know, this is highly fluid. It can be tremendously confusing. And then it could also add in that you may have a mandate that looks uh, troubling and the local law enforcement says, we're not gonna enforce it. So you can have a, a myriad of factors that are working. And what we're encouraging churches is to at least know what they are and to be aware of what they are. And then also, and this is very important, and I, I think uh, at least the, the folks that are on this webinar, a lot of the churches we've talked with, um, to think about what is the best testimony you can have for your church. And I do believe that it is very important that anything we do, we think about maintaining an appropriate testimony for Jesus Christ, because indeed, uh, long after these issues are in the rearview mirror of history, um, we are gonna live with how we responded uh, to our community, to our government officials, and to those that we serve through our churches. And so uh, maintaining a good testimony, a good spirit, I believe is very, very important as you walk through this. And I've also encouraged churches uh, to be balanced. Um, certainly uh, some would say this virus has been overhyped and, and that may be true. Others say, well, no, this virus is deadly and of, of great concern and it's only gonna get worse. And again, that might be true, uh, but we do have to look at things kind of down the middle um, it's obviously not taking the number of lives that was originally anticipated. And so I encourage ministry leaders to, to be balanced, uh, to not fall into either extreme, but to encourage your people uh, that we are going to do everything we can to be healthy and safe and still have ministry. Now, as you open up your churches, there's some things you want to think about. And, and we've talked about some of this, but let me outline it. You need to have precautions in place. If you just say, we're gonna open, we're not gonna do anything different, um, that would be not advisable and could create tremendous liability for your church. Uh, I would encourage you to think about from parking lot to pew or chair and back to parking lot. Uh, many churches thinking about, do we require masks? Uh, when would gloves be appropriate? Certainly on any uh, greeters or people at the door. And to be thinking about a no contact uh, policy where they come in, they're not shaking hands, they're not greeting but really as little as you can have people touching things, the better. So for example, if the door is open for them or propped open, uh, if they can move directly to where they sit, uh, I would recommend right now removing uh, hymn books or things that they would touch with their hands. Uh, no offering plates, have a collection center. Um, I would not pass any communion utensils right now. If you choose to have communion, I would get the disposable packets where they pick it up. But the idea is as little contact as possible with anything unnecessary. And so as your people come in, they can move to their seats. Uh, social distancing is important within the congregation. Uh, if you can have every other pew or some separation in the congregation, uh, very advisable. Uh, some churches are having people wear masks on the way in and out, uh, but they can remove them during the service for singing or fellowship uh, as they're there for the worship. But uh, to be thinking about what procedures work for your church. And uh, also then uh, dismissal is a moment where there can be confusion, uh, thinking about an orderly dismissal or even a by row where people are then able to go back to their vehicles. Now, we're also recommending that churches publish some document or waiver of liability somewhere. Um, some churches are handing them out to people, some churches are publishing them on their website or putting them on the back. But essentially, we want the people to be the ones exercising their religious rights. And so the waiver of liability is along the lines of, I understand COVID exists. I understand I could catch it by going out into public, but I've made this decision to attend church and I'm not gonna hold my church or my pastor or any of the volunteers or staff here responsible if I were to catch COVID. And 
I do believe that's important to put the burden on the people to make the decision. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to have a lawsuit where someone were to say our pastor encouraged us or pushed us or I felt pressured to go to church. So make sure that it's their choice. And then I would also encourage you, if you're in an area where, um, for example, we're watching uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and some cities where uh, they are pushing hard against churches regathering, uh, that you'd be prepared for any fallout. Now, what I mean by that is if media shows up, have a designated spokesperson. Um, if law enforcement shows up, uh, make sure that the pastor or whoever's in leadership is set to handle those issues uh, so there is a coherent response to any church that may find itself entangled. And then also, if you're in an area where you're wondering whether uh, it is okay for you to meet, make sure that you document everything that you're doing, from the waivers to the procedures to the policies. Uh, make sure that you're filming it, uh, taking pictures of it, so if you do find yourself in court, that you're able to defend the actions that you have taken. Uh, we have encouraged churches with what our attorney general has said, and uh, number one, that you do not lose your constitutional rights even in a pandemic. So. If you're wondering, do you have the right to speak or worship? The answer is yes, this is the United States of America. But number two, that in all of this, it's important that uh, churches or religious organizations are treated fairly as compared to um, a secular organization. And we're finding some disparity across the country where, for example, they're opening up uh, salons or tanning beds or liquor stores or things like that. And and still uh, being strict with the churches, and that is a violation of the Constitution. So there needs to be some fundamental fairness. But then number three, the least restrictive alternative analysis. Now let me explain that quickly. The government has a duty to do important things, uh, like protecting health, but they have to infringe the rights of the people in the least restrictive manner possible. And in this case, um, the question is, is closing down, not gathering the least restrictive, or with temperature checks, masks, other procedures in place, can churches safely meet? And so that analysis is a floating analysis. And so we're watching where there is some tension. Uh, some jurisdictions are even maybe treating churches like political pawns uh, back and forth on these issues. But if you are in question, um, as to whether your jurisdiction allows meetings or not. Make sure that you're very careful to document all of the procedures that you've done uh, to make sure that you are safe and able to show a law enforcement or a court uh, how you interacted. And so we're encouraging you in that vein. Now I wanna transition to um, another area and then we're gonna have uh, some additional speakers and then take questions from the participants. But with regard to the government funding that has been made available uh, through the PPP program, um, we are now watching where uh, many, many churches have been able to be uh, blessed by this. And I want to encourage you to realize that there is not a violation of your religious rights by accepting this program. It's being applied neutrally which means your beliefs, your ability to hire and fire according to your faith, your decisions on who to marry, what standards to have within your organization are completely protected. We have documents from the SBA and working with uh, Senator Rubio from Florida and others, uh, we fought to make sure that churches were included and treated fairly with all their rights protected. Uh, but many of you have received the funding and you're now moving into the period where uh, will these funds be forgiven? And the answer is yes. If documented properly, uh, they will be looking at the eight weeks after you receive the funds, and uh, you can have up to 75% of the funds be allocated to payroll or related benefits, 25% to overhead, that could be rent, mortgage, uh, utilities, operational expenses, and that will be submitted to your lender, and then that will be forgiven in whole. So. Um, we are glad to address that with any of you on an individualized basis or uh, if you have a question on it, but just understanding how that process is working. Uh, there are rules being developed, it's ongoing, but we do wanna make sure, and the SBA wants this, the banks want this, uh, they want those funds forgiven. The goal was to take it from the government to the individual employees, and so we are working to make sure uh, that these funds are allocated correctly and managed in such a way, and we will uh, move forward. Now, 
uh, we have received a, a question, let me address it. Um, our organization um, does indeed represent churches across the nation. And if you go to our website, we have what we call a letter of representation that outlines your constitutional rights. And it also is something that you can provide uh, to law enforcement or to anyone that might challenge you uh, for meeting using appropriate uh, safety and social distancing guidelines. And so uh, you can go to the NCLL website, download that. And I want you to know we are 100% committed to standing with churches. Uh, we want you to be responsible. We want to do things right. We want to do things with a good spirit. Uh, but we believe at this point that churches that responsibly make their own decisions should have their rights protected. And so I do want to let you know at the NCAA, our motto is pretty simple. Uh, if it's wrong, fight it. If it's right, fight for it. And your right to responsibly uh, resume some services and begin moving forward is something that we are honored to stand by and to represent and to defend. And we are certainly uh, wanting to help you with that. Uh, we've also received a question on children's um, programs, whether you should open up the nurseries or a vacation Bible school or things like that. Uh, let me tell you that most churches, and uh, this again is varying as to location and ministry, have really scaled back or eliminated uh, summer programs. Uh, we've watched where even national ministries and camps have had to uh, dispense with their activities. And it's very painful for many of them uh, that is their revenue, that's their ministry, this is a complicated time, but there's just no way to safely uh, gather large numbers of children. Uh, children don't social distance well, and it can be quite complicated. But whatever programs you do have, where you decide to take children out of the care of their parents, we are strongly recommending that you have a written waiver, uh, and this would be where they would sign so for example, if you're gonna open up the nursery, I would recommend that your nursery workers have masks and gloves, the disposable type, and that the parents sign an acknowledgement. I understand that COVID-19 is contagious. I understand my child is being put in this environment. There's precautions in place, but I will not hold the church responsible uh, if my child were to uh, contract COVID-19, arguably in the uh, church uh, environment. So. Um, we're wanting to make sure that you are putting the burden on the individuals where you're not promising the safety, but the individuals are making knowledgeable choices when they place their children with you or when they attend themselves. And again, those documents are available to you. Um, we do have a, a ministry uh, that will address any of the lawsuits or issues that are working across the nation. Uh, one person has asked, can our church talk to you about what constitutional rights we may have or the ability to understand under these lawsuits what they mean? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, we have committed uh, both through our website and through our team, uh, whether they're legal sessions or coaching sessions, uh, we have uh, financial staff that are helping uh, churches work through things in a way where they are able to understand the finances. So if you have a bookkeeper or an individual that handles your finances, maybe a treasurer or volunteer, uh, they can reach out to our uh, legal team, our CPA uh, finance team, honored to help make sure that your finances are being handled appropriately under these programs, but from a constitutional legal standpoint. Now, we are encouraging churches to remember in your testimony, um, it's important that you are able to defend your rights, but do it with a good spirit. And so uh, we have counseled uh, most situations uh, to wait and to work in response to government action as opposed to running into court because you have to establish to the court an immediate harm. And for example, uh, just recently in Maryland, uh, a lawsuit against the governor was struck down. Uh, establishing the harm can sometimes be difficult. Uh, you can have situations where the government lawyers don't do a very good job and they'll admit to the harm. But if they don't admit to the harm, establishing a prospective harm uh, can be difficult. So a lot of times we're encouraging churches, wait until you're actually fined or cited or there is a tangible harm, and then we will be able to take that to court and be able to defend you on constitutional grounds. Now, we're uh, joined uh, by a friend of ours, uh, Ruben Kaysen. Uh, Ruben is the uh, promotion director uh, for the uh, North Carolina Association of Free Will Baptists. Uh, he oversees and leads and works with uh, a number of churches there, a couple hundred in the state, as well as uh, being a national leader and working with others across the nation. 
And uh, we've asked Ruben to uh, join in and to kind of just give us an update as a leader that's uh, ministering to churches, um, exactly what is he finding across North Carolina and uh, the spirit of the churches, and maybe give us just a little update uh, from his perspective. So, Brother Ruben, thank you for joining us, and uh, please share with our viewers. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with you today. And uh, first of all, we want to thank you for everything you and your staff are, are doing on behalf of uh, our churches uh, across our denomination, but across uh, the United States as well. Uh, here in North Carolina, we currently have 156 churches in eight different district associations. Um, and most all of them that uh, we've had communication with uh, are uh, doing everything they can to comply with uh, both the governor and local uh, officials and, and health departments. Uh, we have had a few uh, that, that uh, through this process um, uh, that perhaps continued to just have the doors open, uh, but, but by and large, for the most part, everybody uh, stopped having services uh, and was providing something online um, or recently, most recently, uh, drive-in services. Uh, we've had those that uh, were not able to have um, uh, online services that would make copies of uh, services uh, and distribute them uh, like CDs and, and things. Um, we even have one pastor who doesn't have any of that uh, that sends out a weekly uh, newsletter, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Uh, just to stay in touch with his people, and he calls them periodically. So uh, I've been very encouraged uh, by how our churches here in North Carolina have, has responded to this. Well, Brother Ruben, I will uh, reiterate what you're saying, because I think that's excellent. We need to remember the issue is not can you have church or can you be a church. The issue is the public gathering in a common building. And, and we certainly love our campuses. We love the ability to gather. Mm -hmm. It's a freedom we've enjoyed in America. But uh, what you're reiterating that they're doing there in North Carolina is what we've been encouraging, which is, you know, be the church and, and to step forward and to, to minister and to encourage and to um, think about this in a way that, you know, we are ministering to a lot of hurting individuals. I want to ask Dr. Uh, Eddie Moody to uh, join us, and he is the executive director of the National Association of Rural Baptists, as well as a, a professor and a, a trained expert in psychology. And Doc, thanks for being with us. But um, the pastors are going back to some hurting people. I mean, people are scared. They're scared about their health. They're scared about their jobs. I mean, I, I think 25% or so unemployment rate, and, and we're dealing with a lot of issues and um, I've had a few pastors, when they started opening up, all they wanted to do is preach about COVID-19. And I said, you know, your people may want to hear something else, but uh, give us some expert thoughts in terms of what do we really need to be thinking about as we start ministering to these hurting folks? Well, I think it's important for them to think about depression a little bit. I think we've had quite a few folks uh, that have struggled with that and are struggling in those particular areas. Uh, I think there's also some folks that are going to be going through some anxiety, some uh, different issues on those levels. And I, I think it's also just odd. We have had some of our churches, uh, Attorney Gibbs, who have been able to open up. And one of the things we hear is it's a little bit strange. You know, you're trying to, you've got the social distance and, uh, do I shake hands? Do I not shake hands? There's a little bit of confusion. Uh, is it just like it used to be? So we're trying to help them to just get their people in a new routine, help their people understand it's okay to be struggling. It's okay to be feeling bad uh, about this particular situation, but also to see there's other people who's gone through things like this in the past. One of the ones we talk about is Elijah. And it's kind of like he had to come out of the cave and that's a little bit what we're doing. And so we're, we're stressing that as well to think about what that's like, uh, what your people are like, think about what kinds of things they need to be doing. And one of the things we so appreciate what you and your team have done is you've stressed ministry and we're trying to stress to them, 
please keep doing that. Not think so much about, well, I can't do this or I'm inconvenienced in this way. Keep thinking about your neighbor, keep thinking about your coworker. And another thing we're kind of stressing is there's a little bit of a divide. You can, you can see people that um, don't have to go back to work or have jobs where they can do at home. And there are people that they have to be out there to be able to make money, to be able to survive. And to kind of stress that, that people may have a different mindset if you can do your work at home, as opposed to being someone that uh, works in a grocery store, works on the front lines, know that those are differences. And we want to stress that our folks and our congregations are aware of it, stressing that everybody sees each other's uh, point of view. And, uh, and they're just really there to help people through the hard times they, that they go through. No, that's powerful. And, and we do need to realize that, you know, a lot of these, I, I've had uh, folks that say, you know, the, some of the best givers in my church had a small restaurant or had a hardware store or had a local business. And, you know, they're questioning whether they're going to be able to reopen. And, and so, um, there's going to be a lot of hurting folks, and, and the ministry opportunities are uh, incredible. Um, I had one pastor, he called me yesterday. He said, uh, I got a text uh, from this girl that says, I've been working to get my boyfriend ready to trust Christ, and he's ready. Uh, can we do it by Zoom or in person? So, I mean, we do need to realize there's still lost people uh, that need to know Christ and, and be led to the Lord, and, and that you know, ultimately, uh, the one thing that COVID probably has done that um, I, I don't know that we want to say it's good, but it's at least helped people think about reprioritizing life. And when you look at health and family and values and, and what's really important when many things that, um, you know, vied for attention, whether it's sports or entertainment or travel or cruise ships or different things that have been taken from us, it has made folks really ask those core questions. We're going to open up to our uh, questions, and I know uh, some have been putting them into the chat line, and uh, uh, Ruben and Dr. Moody and myself are available, and uh, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Bailey uh, going through the, the questions and asking them, and then uh, I'll repeat them so you can hear. But Jonathan, what questions are we receiving? If you have a question, uh, just go into the chat line. That just makes it the easiest, I think, um, where that is, and then that can move forward, and then they, they, Jonathan will ask your question. So questions that we have from the attendees. Should a church suggest for its members to get COVID testing, particularly the antibody test, just to ensure that they or them, their families are protected? Um, and just to make sure, should churches go ahead and – uh, require testing or encourage it. Um, I think we want to be real, real careful here. Okay. And, and again, I'm not trying to, if you do that just as a personal opinion, but um, churches are always safest when they say spiritual. Um, Dr. Moody knows a lot, but when he's biblical, he's always safe. The, the minute he starts getting medical or legal or financial, we start getting into a realm where somebody could say, you know, you're acting outside of a, a license or a discipline that you might have. And then uh, also be careful if you are taking temperatures or other things that you're not keeping medical records. Uh, we live in a world right now uh, where there's a lot of concern about uh, HIPAA, privacy, different things. Uh, there's certain things as a church we have to keep, whether it's financial information or credit cards or ways that we're receiving giving. And we're careful with that. But uh, if you are temperature checking, you don't, you know, you don't want to keep logs of all that, put people's names on it, because you start creating a lot of duties for yourself. So I would encourage people towards health and certainly being good stewards of their body like we preach regularly. But I would be a little careful to say, take this drug or go this route or do this test and to move forward. And, and I understand Mr. Bailey can be heard, so I'm going to have him do the next question. Go ahead, sir. How important is it to share precautionary steps taken with the church insurance carrier? How well should we keep them in the loop with what we are or are not doing? Um, I'm recommending that you have very little contact with your insurance company, okay? And, and let me tell you why. You have insurance, you pay for it, okay? If you contact your insurance company and go, hey, there's this mandate, and we're not quite sure we understand it, but we just want to make sure we're covered, all you've created is an opportunity for the insurance company to go, oh, well, there's a man, you're not covered. Here's a letter. 
and you've created a problem for yourself. Now you have what I call an unnecessary fight. Um, with your insurance company, in this instance, I would say treat it like we'll ask for forgiveness, not permission. Um, and if you have a COVID related issue and you turn it into your insurance and they start fussing with you, we'll fight it at that point. But I would not preemptively go to your insurance company because they're just going to tell you no, which is the uh, most beneficial to them. And then you might get strange answers too. You know, like, well, maybe we're not sure. We'll check on it. We'll get to you in a month. And it's not going to be helpful in this COVID world. So your insurance company, you pay for the premiums. You're entitled to coverage. And uh, if an issue comes up, we'll fight to make sure the insurance company treats you fairly. But I would not be contacting them um, to get permission to meet because the easiest thing is for them to say no. There's a question for Pastor Ruben. Uh, what are some of the churches in North Carolina doing as far as having a reopen date? And what would be some of the indoor services dates that you're seeing based on the current conditions in North Carolina? We've had a uh, few, maybe a dozen or so, that have uh, already started having inside services. Uh, but most are waiting until either this Sunday or May the 31st before they start having inside servicing uh, services, rather. And, um, and they're opening uh, those services with social distancing in place and a lot of the things that uh, Dr. Gibbs mentioned earlier. Is there anything specific that we should be thinking about in regards to VBS and some of our summer programs? Well, I would uh, probably repeat what I said previously. Most churches have um, scratched VBS this year. Now, again, I'm not trying to demoralize you. I believe in VBS. I love the outreach. I know it's a highlight for many churches. But the reality is this summer, going and asking people that are not part of your church to send their children even for a day event is, I think, very risky and maybe not the optics you want. If you are going to have a VBS, go late, get into July, get in August, get as late as you can, make sure that you have the waivers. But then also, I would pass to recommend you sit down with your volunteers. I mean, are, are the older ladies, are the men that generally help, are they going to feel comfortable in this type of environment? And then I do think, and, I, and again, I'm not a I, I've been on airplanes now where the masks are mandatory and other things. I don't enjoy them, okay, so I'm not here to sell masks, but I will tell you if you are going to take other people's children into your care for any protracted time period, that the optics of gloves, masks, very heavy procedures, you know, are probably advisable. So really weigh out, is this what we want to do or not, and uh, most churches are uh, postponing till next year, uh, with the idea being it's just not really the way to do it. And, and, and these are not just individual local churches, uh, national ministry organizations um, that um, do camping and do things at a very sophisticated level. Um, they're looking at things like, we just can't put our workers and our volunteers at risk, uh, even to do the trainings and the things that would be necessary. It's just not gonna be possible this year. So. Um, thinking through that, most organizations are not, but if you do proceed forward, make sure that you've got the waivers signed by the parents and that you're operating carefully. Uh, any type of transportation, some people have asked about bus ministries and things like that. I've strongly recommended all of that. Till the public schools resume uh, transportation, uh, you would be very advised to wait till August, September or later um, and make sure that there is the concept of kids getting in a vehicle and being driven that that is acceptable. Um, I'm in Illinois, the governor has mandated masks when in public, when social distancing is not possible. Do you re recommend that I ask our people to wear masks once we reopen in a few weeks? Uh, in Illinois, I would say yes. And, and please hear me, I'm not in love with masks, okay? I just wanna let you know, I think the optics are strong. Um, I realize they get in their pew. Some people are going to like wear them constantly. Okay. And that's fine. Some people are going to take them off, hang them out of here, put them on their lap. But I would at least ask them to wear them in and out. So like in the moments where they're coming into the building and, and being around others, and then when they're leaving, um, that looks good, by the way, if people take pictures of your church or other things that you're taking it seriously. But um, I do think in more, um, hostile, and I use that in the sense of more regulated areas, 
uh, that anything you can do to uh, raise the standard. And again, I, I'll use the airlines as an example. Um, and again, these are major industries, they're for profit, but they're not serving food. They're not running the carts down the aisle. They're requiring masks the entire time you're on the airplane. Um, you know, you have to wear the mask through the security lines. They ask you to take it off so they can ID you. I mean, it's a, it's a different world, okay? And so I think some of that standard is what will be expected for churches. And so uh, in Illinois, I would recommend that you at least have the mask in and out. To what degree is a governor's decree or executive order, i.e. social distancing standards, the law versus merely recommendations? Well, I... It's the law in this respect, okay? Unless it's specifically a recommendation. All of these government officials, okay? The governors, originally the president of the White House, um, then you get into county officials, city officials, mayors, they have what we call emergency authority, okay? So there's a law somewhere that says, in an emergency, uh, our governor can do some really powerful things, okay? And these are deemed to be acts of war, these are deemed to be hurricanes, these are deemed to be major events. And the pandemic with COVID-19 has kicked in these what we call emergency power provisions. So in a sense, these government officials are issuing mandates under those laws with authority to do so. Now, there can be regulations where people try to revoke that authority. Some legislatures have battled it, some judges have battled it. But the reality is when they speak, they do have the force of law. Now, you say, okay, well, they're proclaiming these laws, but what are the penalties? And that can vary from place to place. Uh, it's like driving 72 in a 70 mile an hour speed limit. You're breaking the law, but it's highly unlikely that you'll get pulled over or cited. But if you're going 95, pretty likely you may well get pulled over and significantly cited. So, um, you know, it depends on the situation, depends on the commitment of the government. And um, we've had churches that have been cited for uh, financial penalties, uh, issued cease and desist orders, some threatened, but largely um, the enforcement has been pretty minimal because churches have worked, I think, very hard. And I think rightfully so for our testimony's sake, uh, churches have worked to be uh, good citizens and they've tried to minister around this crisis and to evaluate it. And so uh, churches that have maintained good spirits and uh, been smart about it uh, have not run into legal difficulty. Uh, we're uh, joined by uh, Eddie Aliff, uh, who is the uh, director, works in Richmond, Virginia, uh, with the VAIB, Virginia Association of Independent Baptists. And Brother Eddie, we're, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, we, we figured we had North Carolina and Tennessee, so now, now we'd get a little Virginia in the mix. Uh, but uh, give us what's going on in Virginia. How are the churches doing? What's the, the opening? And, and how are things uh, in your state at this point with regard to churches beginning to minister again with public services? Uh, well, I'm hoping you can hear me. Can, can you we can hear you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I was a little surprised. I wasn't sure I would be given the opportunity, but I do appreciate this. Virginia has a confused governor because he, has, he said he was going to open the entire state up this past Sunday, but the, on Friday before that decided he was going to restrict certain areas where those individual, where those leaders wanted it restricted, which kind of concerned me. So Northern Virginia and the city of Richmond all were, um, were still held off from being able to have church meetings and to loosen the opportunities for churches to come together. Other than that, uh, the churches that I've heard from that decided they wanted to, and not everyone decided, I thought they were very wise, in choosing to some set, lay out a plan. Some of them had larger uh, memberships and they wanted to be assured that they would be able to do this in an orderly fashion, as you said, to the least opportunity to spread the virus. And so the churches met and um, uh, it was exciting to be able to see churches come back together. Before this, uh, we've had one death of a, of a pastor, not in our group, but in Virginia. Uh, that happened early on, and so it it came out that this is real, and we need to be careful. And so I can tell you that the majority of the pastors that I represent have been very thankful and wise 
thankful for the information they've been provided by NCLL and very uh, wise in how they move forward. So uh, at this present time, I'm not aware of anything. I do know um, there may have been some churches in the northern area that did meet, and I said, that is up to you. Uh, but if you are going to do something like this, I would suggest you contact legal counsel just sure. to be prepared. And well, so that's I had kind to, of where we are. I had a friend of mine in, in small little church, and I said, so how are you handling the shutdown? He was in rural West Virginia, and he was like, what shutdown? We've just been meeting, you know? I mean, so I, I do realize there have been some folks that, you know, depending on the area and the, the level of, you know, size of the church and the geography of it. Um, I did get a, a question. It's a good one. Uh, can we mandate masks? Can we mandate gloves? What can we mandate? Well, um, again, whether you should or not is your decision. Okay. We, we believe you give good people good information. They make good decisions. But churches can do whatever they would like. So let me explain. If you say members only, that's fine. If you say we require temperature check, if you don't comply, you got to leave. That's fine. We're gonna require you to wear a mask on the way in. If you won't, you sit in the parking lot, you watch this online, but you're not coming in. Now, whether you choose to do that, okay, I, I want you to understand there's a difference between your legal right to mandate it and the wisdom. Um, you know, in certain regions, pastors have said, we've kind of suggested masks, half our people do it, half don't. Well, you know, if, if it's relaxed, and I wouldn't make it an issue. If you're in Illinois, you're in Northern Virginia, you're in certain a Baltimore area, Maryland, um, yeah, I'd say, you know, what, everybody's going to wear a mask. You, know, you can take it off while you're singing and you can, you know, not be uncomfortable during the service, but then, you know, you're socially distant, you're six feet apart. And then when you leave, you're going to put the mask on. So uh, the idea is you have all of those rights uh, to control what is coming in and out. Now, we have not yet seen this, but I've heard this. So let me just also mention, there are people that fear a little bit somebody that does have the virus sneaking into church. You know, and that's one of the reasons why we're recommending uh, that you're careful. You know, like if you're monitoring from the parking lot in, um, you know, checking temperatures, checking people, being a little more inquisitive as to visitors. Again, I wouldn't live in fear of that. We always want to give the gospel and, and be church, but we are living in politically uh, unprecedented times. There's a lot of acrimony back and forth, uh, how things should be handled, how things should be addressed. And so, uh, encouraging churches in that vein. And then also don't go into full ramp up. Um, a lot of churches are not doing the Sunday school or the small groups ahead of service. You know, start with a service, get it down a little bit. Uh, remember, you're supposed to be doing some pretty extensive cleaning, and this is not just vacuuming and picking up papers, but you should try to be wiping the pews and actually being able to show that you're doing what you can. And so I do think uh, as you begin your service schedule buildup uh, to make sure that you're allotting proper volunteers or proper staff and time to make sure that the, the cleaning procedures can be followed. What are the thoughts on having small gatherings, small group meetings? Should leadership promote such gatherings at this time? Well, I would say absolutely. I mean, small groups are deemed to be much safer. And, and Dr. Moody, you might be able to address this because I know you've done a lot with uh, churches that want to have smaller groups and thinking about, you know, getting them together and making them effective. But uh, give some thoughts on the success and what you're seeing with small groups that can be powerful for a church. So the, it can work as long as it's within the guidelines of their local area. We do uh, encourage them to still spread out. Um, there are some churches and that's the people that would do this kind of thing. They were already under the limits, you know, whether it be 50 or, or 25. And I think, I think that's fine. I will say if you're in a situation where they have a breakout, just being inside is dangerous. Um, and so you want to keep that in the back of your mind um, and what we have encouraged folks to do is just call, talk to your local health department, see where they're at, um, and encourage them even to come. You might even use it as an outreach way. Uh, I think some people have done things like going to parks, like uh, Sunday school or life groups or whatever that would be. And we've encouraged people to do those things as long as they practice the social distancing. And we are seeing people are just hungry to get out and about and, uh, and be with others. And so we do encourage them to do that as long as they do it safely. 
um, because it is a definite boost. You know, it's a definite psychological and health as well as spiritual boost, we think. We're getting a question. Do you recommend fogging the church or doing something that sterilizes all the air? And obviously, if you have those capabilities, okay, there are things that you can do to really clean. You know, you want to think about your vents, your air systems, your filters. But there's also what I call the reasonable practicability. You know, I mean, if somebody in your church can do such a thing for you and it's cost effective, it's a great idea. But I wouldn't say that's the expected standard. I think if you look at what businesses are doing um, that you can parallel, because businesses obviously are trying to make money, they want to keep their workers safe. So if you kind of follow the guidelines where uh, people are doing things um, with the um, you know, social distancing, appropriate equipment, um, you know, make sure that you are cleaning the facility as best you can, um, you know, uh, limiting restrooms to one person at a time, even if they're designed for more, Thinking about things like that, I think, are more practical for most churches. Uh, we got a question on communion. Um, I'm recommending right now not, when I say traditional communion, I'm talking the, the trays and the little juices, and we pour them and pass them, and everybody's touching them. Um, they look miserable, but they're at least sterile. They sell these little packets, little wafer on top, juice on the bottom, and, um, and they are in a little throwaway. Um, I would recommend right now, they're not very expensive. The churches I know that have bought it have been happy with it. Um, then you put it somewhere, probably by your offering box. Make them think about giving while they get their communion packet and they carry their packet. Now be prepared. Uh, somebody's going to put it in their pocket and break the juice and spill it on their pan. I mean, they're, you know, you're putting them in the hands of the people. But if you feel like communion is appropriate at this point, uh, I would recommend the disposable model. And then at the end, uh, garbage cans on the way out the door, they throw it all away. Uh, that's probably the post-COVID. And that may be the permanent. I, I had one uh, fellow say to me, man, I was so happy not to pour juice into those little cups. So we're never going back. So uh, I'll just tell you, that's the more sterile approach. But um, with that being the, the, the vein, that will allow you to have communion if you choose to do so. Does the publication of social distancing guidelines and expectations create a legal duty of enforcement by staff and leadership when congregants don't comply? To a level, yes. And I'm just being transparent. I mean, anytime you put a standard out, I mean, so if you say in our children's ministry, we have a two worker rule. We don't want anybody alone with kids because we don't want an accusation. We don't want a kid to get hurt. And you know, this one worker keeps taking a kid off to a room by himself. You go, well, we got the policy. I just wish he'd follow it. Well, we all know the answer is no. You need to go find out what's going on. You need to protect that kid. You need to warn or remove that worker because that's a violation of policy. And together, we're all going to pull forward and, and do what's right to protect the children. I think in the same way, with a certain degree of reasonableness, we don't need to be the, the, the mass police or the you know draconian, you're five feet and you know, four inches apart, not six feet. I mean, I don't think we need to be ridiculous, but collectively we need to work together. And, you know, I've been at a few events where people start to want to shake hands. I'm like, you know, brother, I'd love to shake your hand, but right now let's just encourage what we're trying to do here. And, and that's not said to be unfriendly or weird, but I think if everybody works together, uh, we can enforce these things. But yes, anytime you put a standard out, um, and by the way, that's a dress code, that's a platform standard, that's where you park your car, what doors you go in, what doors stay locked. I mean, any standard you set uh, for safety, welfare, or the good of the people is something that you should be willing to be reasonably held accountable to. And again, don't feel paranoid. You don't have to be you know, absolute. But if you say we're going to clean the auditorium in between every service, uh, then you've kind of assumed the duty to make sure that gets done. Um, we had a pastor stated that uh, we had mentioned about money coming from the government. He wasn't made aware of it. Um, and so he was curious what kind of funding there was available. Well, this man of God has not been watching much TV. Okay, I, I'm teasing. Uh, but with this, um, the government has put massive $3 trillion into the government through different programs. Churches were originally left out. Uh, Marco Rubio fought to get them in. Um, you're all but brother at the end. I mean, it, there are some local banks where you might still qualify. Uh, but basically, um, I would encourage you, if this is something you would like to do, uh, to jump on it like today and to be contacting a smaller bank. 
and asking for the CARES Act application, the payroll protection application, or the EID loan if you would qualify. If you're confused or wondering, uh, Mr. Bailey can walk you through where you could go. Our website can as well. Um, but if you've said, you know what, I haven't done it, I don't plan to, the, the programs are about tapped out. Uh, there are some conversations about expanding them, but right now I think that's pretty much quagmired. But uh, if you do say, I've just never heard of it, I want to jump in, do it quickly because we're about out of time. If, if we ask people to wear masks, number one, should we ask them to leave if they're not wearing the mask or should we allow them to stay? And should we also provide masks to the congregation? Again, I'm going to tell you, you have the legal right to require them. So if you choose to let them stay without them, my recommendation, if you're in a hot spot area, make them wear them in, make them wear them out and then let it be a little more optional during the service as they're scattered through the auditorium. I, I certainly don't expect a pastor to preach with one or a singer to sing with one from the platform. That would be kind of silly, muffling the noise and other things. But pastor, if you're in a bad area and you wear your mask to the platform, I think that's a good testimony, good example uh, for the people. Um, you can certainly provide some if you so choose. I do think you should have some of those disposable gloves if you're gonna have people holding doors or touching different things or even doing the cleaning, You know, let them put on the gloves. They wipe the pews down with the, the wipes or other things and then they can crawl out of way. So any equipment or things that you provide for your people, but legally you're not required to provide it. But if you're gonna be a little more enforcing of it, like somebody said, oh, I didn't bring mine, I forgot mine. Hey, we have one, let me get you one. And um, again, uh, the temperature checks are a little more extreme in, in more hotspot areas, but they do now have these uh, touchless. And I mean, I've been into events now where they zap my head and tell me my temperature and I walk on and it's really non-invasive. You have some nurses or some medical people in your church or some moms, um, you know, again, you don't have to keep any records, but the goal is if somebody triggers a, high 99, 100, 101 fever, um, you may want to stop them and just say, hey, it doesn't look like you're feeling very well. Probably not a good idea for you to come. What percentage of sanctuary capacity do you recommend churches to use if we go ahead and reopen? Um, sanctuary capacity is, a, a, and again, different state mandates say up to 50% or others, but um, it depends on your church and your crowd. If you have 500 seats and 100 people, you're fine. You can space them around. But I would think about um, trying to maintain some separation between family units. So if you can kind of keep six feet between and a little spacing, um, I would work more on your crowd fitting in what you have. If you say, well, there's just no way we can make it work, uh, think about multiple services. Um, you know, think, and again, I, I like it if you can all be in one, I understand the energy, I understand what you want ultimately, but right now in the post COVID world, um, you know, a friend of mine was running 500 and he feels like he can safely take in about 150. And so he's now looking at three or four services spread out throughout the day. It's a lot of work for him, but he's willing to do it for his people and feels like that's a good testimony moving forward. So um, it's an individualized analysis. It's not a hard, fast percentage. Um, it's your crowd, it's your building, and it's your mandate kind of in combination. Much of the guidance is talking about singing, congregational singing, especially singing coming from the platform. Do you have any recommendations specifically around congregational singing and or the choir? Well, you're just bound to determine to get me in trouble here because people love their congregational and they love the choirs and they love all that. But I'll just say what they are saying is people without mass singing spew more. And I think it probably makes sense. They're being louder and so germs and things get, are more easily transmitted. So if you say we really want to minimize the germ spread, then, you know, do more platform singing and less congregational singing or ask them to hum along or follow along. Um, I think there's a reasonable balance. I think there, I would do some congregational singing because your people are missing it. But I would certainly not go into big, long praise and worship sets or big, long congregation. I wouldn't have a sing fest right now. I would think about less um, congregational singing uh, while people are more concerned about it. But, um, you know, the, the health experts would say, don't have any public singing. So I would say that was where they would be at, but I'm not quite to that point. I'm less concerned from the platform uh, because you know it's, it, they're a good distance generally from the congregation. So special music um, and things. Now a choir, let's just talk about choir. You know, most choirs are clustered in there. Um, I would think about spreading your choir a little bit and that might even feel a little weird you know, across the whole front, you know, going maybe even down an aisle or around, you know, having a little distance where they're not just clustered in there. 
if you say, ah, we are going to cluster them up there, then I would suggest that you do it just for the song and get them out. So don't leave them up there the whole time. But uh, those are decisions that you, and then uh, here's one more thing, Pastor. Um, don't make all the decisions. Ask your choir, what do they feel comfortable doing? What would they suggest? Do they have any ideas? And, you know, sometimes not having all the answers and asking for their recommendations, and you may get some great ideas that you haven't thought of that they're very good with. And, and then when it's their idea, you'll have some buy-in. So you have some options on all that, but singing congregationally is uh, deemed as one of the risks in public gathering. Should a waiver be signed individually by attendees, and what should it say? Um, I do not recommend signing waivers by church attendees. I'll tell you why. You'll miss people. <laughs> okay, the, the reality is, so, or you'll have some guy saying, hey, I fought in Vietnam. I'm not signing nothing, and I'm an American, and what are you going to do about it? Okay, you know, now you got hostels. Okay, so I like it more as a policy. By the way, here it is, you know, attending this service. You're doing so at your own risk and we don't require a signature, you're just put on notice. And then everybody's covered by it. So, and it's also logistically a pain in the neck, um, having everybody sign something, collecting it, gathering it, dealing with it. And then um, when I do say a signature, I'm talking about taking children into care. If you're gonna have a nursery, if you're gonna have a, any type of program where the kids are away from their parents and they're in your care, then yes, I would recommend a waiver from mom and dad saying, I will not hold you responsible for COVID-19. Do, do you recommend holding off on any kind of visitation such as door-to-door -door outreach until after the summer months? Uh, yes, I do. And I, I, again, don't say that to, uh, I'm all for evangelism, outreach and other things, but right now, um, you bang on people's doors and you don't, you could be exposing your volunteers, you're exposing the people. Remember, we're going to evangelize, not to create crisis. And so right now that method of outreach is probably not advisable. We are in upstate New York and we're wondering if we should post our plans to the church's social media and draw attention, or so we should simply call our members and share our plan from joining back together and keep it typically a little more quiet. Personally, I'm an attorney, keep it quiet, okay? I mean, more public, um, you always run the risk that uh, adverse parties, you know, rule number one to public speaking, know your audience. Uh, the World Wide Web is a big public audience. And so I would keep it to the members and not make it so widely disseminated. Um, how would you recommend we handle things after we reopen if we find out that someone in attendance has tested positive and do we need to inform people? Should we inform anybody? How do we need to handle what information gets disseminated after we find out someone has tested positive? Great question. And it's going to be a little bit of a, a trick question because it is absolutely inappropriately to publicly disseminate the health information of another individual. Okay. So like if, if I know brother Eddie is battling cancer and, and he doesn't want anybody to know, and I start telling people, I'm actually violating his rights. I mean, he has the right to his own health care, his own decisions, his own privacy. So always be careful that you have permission before you share. Um, if you say this person's being obstinate, they had COVID, they won't give us permission, then what you would do is you would give a general announcement. You would say, we have been made aware that an individual that chooses to remain anonymous has attended our service and did contract COVID-19. Uh, we just want to make you aware of that. We don't believe anybody else was, you know, we had social distancing, things in place, but we just want you to be aware. And I think letting people know is a courtesy. It may not be legally required, but as pastors, ministry leaders, if I was in your church, I would like to know that just for my own benefit and knowledge and, and being able to make my own decisions. But you're under no duty necessarily to inform them, but it's more of a, a courtesy and, and what we feel would be spiritually right. Um, we've already answered the question about temperature checks, um, just to, under, to make sure we're clear. What is your perspective on taking temperatures as people enter? Um, I thought it would feel weirder than it does. Uh, they have these touchless things that are quick. Uh, they look like, if you haven't seen one, they look like a little gun with a little thing on the end. They kind of aim it at you. They're not too close to you. Click. And um, they generally tend to read a little low. I was a little worried, like if they... Uh, you know, everybody shows us 100 and now, you know, half the congregation is being turned away. So um, I have found the organizations, a lot of preschools are using them daily. A number of Christian schools are planning to use them when they open back up. Um, a lot of churches in hot areas have started using them. 
uh, with really no problems. I think the question is, do you have the equipment and do you have the volunteers? You know, I would not recommend that you have just one guy standing there trying to do 500 people or you're going to create a problem for yourself. But if you can manage it and do it quickly and efficiently uh, as people are walking in, uh, that works well. Well, folks, uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, number one, for coming, a, a good number from across the nation. Uh, Brother Ruben in North Carolina, Brother Eddie in Virginia, Dr. Moody, Tennessee, and to the nation. Uh, thank you, men. Uh, these are all uh, friends of mine, friends of the ministry. We hold them in huge esteem. And by the way, they make themselves available. If, if you say, I would like to talk with one of those men, uh, their offices and their ministries are uh, serving leaders, and, and they do an outstanding job with it. Uh, the NCAA team is available to you uh, for conversation, for coaching, for help. Um, we did this webinar because we're kind of in this May moment where people are opening up. Um, we're hoping again that all of this will become the new normal and maybe we won't have to talk about it as much. But thank you for your prayers, your friendship, and uh, be encouraged. What you're doing is of the Lord, and uh, let's boldly declare his truth to this world that so desperately needs to hear it. Uh, God bless, and have a wonderful afternoon.